guys, this is another edition of Harlem 411. Today, in this cold, on this cold day, we're at Riverside Church. There are a few things going on here, so we're going to go inside and check out and see what's happening at Riverside Church. We'll be right back. inside Riverside Church. We're going to walk around and see what goes on inside this big cathedral. We'll be right back. Hey guys, so we're back and we're at the rehearsal of the Ebony Ecumenical Ensemble. And I have Reverend Eugene Palmore here with me. Hi, how are you? How are you doing? Thanks. Thanks for taking a second. We dragged him out of his rehearsal. As you can see, everybody's rehearsing. So tell us a little bit about the ensemble and what goes on here at Riverside. Okay, the ensemble will be celebrating its 34th anniversary this year and our concert will be February 2nd, next Saturday, at Postos Community College. And it's not affiliated with Riverside Church. Most of the members in the choir go to other churches, but um, we've done concerts here several years, and so we just, we're part of the neighborhood and community here, so we just enjoy being here whenever we can get here. I love it. What do you have to say to any young people who are thinking about returning to church, going to church, the Word, the Bible, or... Well, anybody who's thinking about going to church, go. Find out what it means to you. Go someplace where it's fun. Go someplace where they listen to you, go someplace where your voice will be heard, your music will be sung, where you can just be young and learning the word. Don't try to go being an old folk at a church. Go being young and just do you. That's what church is about, being you. Love it. Do you. Well, we're going to let you get back to your rehearsal. We won't steal you out anymore, but we thank you and we want to make it out to the concert. So when is that? Okay, the concert begins next Saturday, February 2nd at Hostos Community College at 7 o'clock. We have tickets and we'll give you some flyers, okay? Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Hey guys, so we are still in Riverside. We got a chance to see some things that happened here at Riverside, but today our main focus was to get to the conference, which is a new paradigm to save mankind. Now we're about to go inside. You're gonna hear some pretty interesting things. I need you guys to hold on to the side of your chairs, put on, you know, put your ears out, put your listening gloves on, or do you put your thinking cap on? Whatever you're gonna put on, put it on because we're gonna hear some things that are gonna blow us away. Stay tuned and we'll be right back. The Almighty works marvels for me. Holy is his name. His mercy is from age to age on those who fear him. He puts forth his arm and strength and scatters the proud hearted. He casts the mighty from their thrones and raises the lowly. He fills the starving with good things and sends the rich away empty. He protects Israel, his servant, remembering his mercy, the mercy promised to our fathers, to Abraham and his sons forever. Glory be to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. If I had the chance to have a show on your channel, it would be a comedy show about the workplace and the challenges that people have there. And it would entail examples such as if someone has a mean boss or they can't figure out their actual job and title. The message that will go out to the audience is that people can overcome challenges no matter what it is at work, that they should know how to deal with it and be strong during the process.
The show that I have is The Jose Show, where I produce it and the host of it. The show is about youth nonprofit organizations that benefit young people, where I feature youth organizations that are working with the young people, that is doing tremendous work with these young people to get where they want to be in their careers. And the importance of this show is to make sure that young people get a chance to show off their talent and perform, bring out different discussions that they want to talk about. of conflict, the executive gets all the power. The taxes, the money, the secrecy, the contracts, the footprints in the sands of time. And therefore, the executive had concocted danger out of thin air in order to justify warfare. Therefore, the members universally and unanimously insisted that only the Congress of the United States, which did not confront a conflict of interest in entering war, would not increase, but would have its power diminished in times of war, could vote a war resolution. Only the Congress of the United States, and indeed the first president, George Washington, who himself presided over the Constitutional Convention, stated, before any president can use the military offensively, Congress must provide a declaration of war. Thomas Jefferson needed 10 statutes to use force against the Barbary pirates who were engaged in an international crime of piracy. Now why did the Founding Fathers believe it was very important to set a very exacting threshold in order to move the country from a state of peace to a state of war? The definition of war, ladies and gentlemen, is it makes what's customarily murder legal. It makes what's customarily murder legal. In other words, you return to a state of nature. As Cicero said, in times of war, the law is silent. It isn't that there can never be occasions that justify war. We couldn't have responded to Japanese attack at Pearl Harbor with indifference. But you need to have very high and exacting standards of provocation to justify war, because you return to a state of nature, whereas Thomas Hobbes wrote in the Leviathan, life is poor, brutish, nasty, and short.
If I had the chance to have a show on your channel, it would be a comedy show about the workplace and the challenges that people have there. And it would entail examples such as if someone has a mean boss or they can't figure out their actual job and title. The message that will go out to the audience is that people can overcome challenges no matter what it is at work, that they should know how to deal with it and be strong during the process. Well, if I had a chance to make a show on the youth channel, it would be called the J-Man Radio Show. It's going to be a show about having like um, some sketch comedy, some playing live music, and also me and my friends are going to get together so we could talk about topics that's going on in the world. But there's more. There's more to life than doing nothing, playing video games, watching music, watching TV. I mean, I'm here creating my own show. You should do the same thing. The show that I have is The Jose Show, where I produce it and I'm the host of it. The show is about youth nonprofit organizations that benefit young people, where I feature youth organizations that are working with the young people, that is doing tremendous work with these young people to get where they want to be in their careers. And the importance of this show is to make sure that young people get a chance to show off their talent and perform and bring out different discussions that they want to talk about. Hey guys, so we're talking to some of the members of the audience, and tell us your name, tell us what you think about what you saw today. Was there anything that blew your socks off, or that just left you floored, or whatever you thought? Oh, my name's Eduardo Toronto, and one of the interesting things about this conference that is, I think, different from anything that you'll see, you know, especially in speeches by uh, people in politics today, con congressmen, senators, even presidents, is this idea of the future and that what our mission here today um, not only for you know my generation and the generation before me but after me is that we need to realize that for this better world it, it's about peace and cooperation and it's about creativity and i think that's an idea that's pretty foreign to people this idea of creativity that what we do as human beings should be for the development of somebody's potential creativity, whether it be in an education, in a work environment, or just raising children. The idea is that we are not animals. We are different from the animal kingdom. And that our difference, this, this special ability that we have to be cognitive, to think, to be creative, is what makes us stand out over any other species on this entire planet and that that is what should be developed within human beings and that is the ability for everybody in any walk of life in any station any color any creed any religion to be given those types of opportunities and i think that's exactly what's been missing in not only our culture here in the united states but around the world and i have a feeling that as a duty as a citizen it should be our responsibility to make sure that no matter what station of life you're in, no matter what color or creed you are, you have that opportunity to develop that creative potential for yourself. And not only do you want to do it for yourself, though, that you want to do it for the future generations. I mean, I know it sounds cliche, but there's, a, I think it's true that as far as being human, the idea should be that we should leave something better for the future generations. I mean, I'm a, I look young, but I'm a little bit older, and, and I think, you know, when I talk to my nieces and nephews and cousins, it's very surprising because you can kind of see it in their eyes how sort of pessimistic they are, maybe even a little bit delusional, that, that they feel that there's kind of no future for them. 
as the way things are progressing now. And so I, you know, take it upon myself that that's not a good thing. I, I don't want them to have to have that feeling. So now we have to ask ourselves, well, what is it that we can do and, and youth can do to change that situation? And I, you know, I think for us as Americans, the thing is to actually become a citizen, stop being a consumer, and become a citizen of this country. Um, and you know, if uh, if your congressman, if your senator, if your president isn't doing what is needed to bolster that, to create that future for you, then you need to be the one to tell them. Well, you heard it, guys. We need to stand up and we need to talk to our congressmen. And senators. And the president of the United States. <laughs> you can do it. So thank you so much, Eddie. Edward. Eduardo. Eduardo. <laughs> can we call you Eddie? That's <laughs> Okay. Thank you so much. Okay. We'll be right back. If I had the chance to have a show on your channel, it'll be a comedy show about the workplace and the challenges that people have there. And it would entail examples such as if someone has a mean boss or they can't figure out their actual job and title. The message that will go out to the audience is that people can overcome challenges no matter what it is at work, that they should know how to deal with it and be strong during the process. The show that I have is The Jose Show, where I produce it and I'm the host of it. The show is about youth nonprofit organizations that benefit young people, where I feature youth organizations that are working with the young people, that is doing tremendous work with these young people to get where they want to be in their careers. And the importance of this show is to make sure that young people get a chance to show off their talent and perform and bring out different discussions that they want to talk about. Even for the superpowers, ultimately, who will go the same way of the Roman and all other empires unless they step back from the precipice. Because the Founding Fathers stated repeatedly, freedom and liberty cannot exist in a state of perpetual warfare. Those instruments of authority and power that were initially concocted to fight foreign danger will come back domestically and destroy liberty at home. Ladies and gentlemen, that is exactly what has happened since 9-11. We are told at the outset, we must fight them in Kabul. We must fight them 6,000 miles away or else we will end up fighting them in Washington, D.C. That justified Guantanamo, preventive detention without accusation or trial, unilateral use of force by the president in secrecy, intercepting our phone conversations, emails, and otherwise without warrants. We have a moment here to speak with one of our panelists. Thank you so much for taking the time to speak with us. Hey, thank you for inviting me on your show. Oh, sure, sure. So we spoke about a lot of things. We spoke about power. Um, you know, power ought to be proportionate to its objects. Am I saying that right? That's right. Okay, so tell us a little bit about power and your interpretation of power and the meaning behind it. Well, just starting from the end, and we'll go back to the beginning. The objects of the, what I was referring to, the objects of Article 1, Section 8 of the U.S. Federal Constitution are things like taxation, debts, regulation of trade. So the power is to regulate trade. The power is to collect taxes. The power is to regulate the currency, something we're not doing right now, right, with all this crazy funny money that's been created that led to the big blow up of 2008, which everybody's gone bankrupt cities and states across the country due to the lack of Congress acting to uh, go to affect the object that's related to their power. So the object is the currency. The proper means to express the power of Congress is something that would, ins would ins regulate the currency, Glass-Steagall, a law. A law is a means. So if you have a legislative power, 
the means to express it is different laws. And the reason that Hamilton was so hot about this in the Federalist Papers, and I would encourage viewers to read Federalist Papers 30, 31, 32, and 33. And those define, as he says, a principle which can be applied to the whole Constitution. So if you want to know how our Constitution works, those express what he was dealing with in forming actual, an actual functional union of all the states. Now you mentioned a few things, Glass-Steagall. Can you tell us what Glass-Steagall is, just for some of us yeah. who are not familiar with it? Yeah, this was the action taken by uh, Franklin Delano Roosevelt in 1933 in the Congress, which said that banks cannot be insured by the federal government if they have low value securities. When you're dealing with a stock market and things like that, they were not allowed to hold low level securities. And they were not allowed to have a, a commercial bank that was backed by the government was not allowed to use more than 2% of its capital in investing in risky ventures, which is what securities are. They right. can become risky. Right. Now today, it's probably 60%, 70%. You look at the so-called most solvent bank in the United States, Wells Fargo, and they have trillions of, le of outstanding uh, exposure in derivatives that if, if the bets went sour, you would lose all your money. There's no protection against you right now. Why? Because Glass-Steagall is not in, in office. Because what Glass-Steagall did is it said if you can only have 2% of your capital in securities if you want to be a commercial bank. If you want to be an investment bank, go gamble all day. But you're not going to be backed by the federal government. But Timothy Geithner and Barack Obama continued every single thing to the T and more so than what George Bush and Hank Paulson did with the bailout in 2007. They lent $26 trillion through the Federal Reserve to all these banks to basically shell game, make it seem as though their assets aren't totally bankrupt. And there's trillions of dollars sitting in, these, in the Federal Reserve that's been lent to these banks and lent back to the Federal Reserve just to make it look like all this phony, uh, valueless securities, mortgage-backed securities, asset back securities, all these funny names they give to this stuff. It was nothing but a huge derivative bubble to just paper over the fact that we have not invested in the economy for so long and we don't have any value anymore. We're a consumer economy. Wow, so that's that's a lot. And it's basically saying that our paper money is not worth anything? Well, no, what I'm not saying is that. because. Money is the value of you know your purchasing power. It represents the value of the nation. Our nation is not worth very much if our government is not using its powers of the Constitution. And that was my point today, that that legislators have to rediscover their powers and use the proper means to enact a, a nationwide recovery. It's not going to come magically. They have to reclaim their power from the financial markets and and you know that we that the markets determine value. What determines value should be the federal government regulating the currency, increasing industry and production. It's very easy. Simply don't watch. Uh, don't, don't applaud. In fact, it's not a matter of simply don't watching, saying those are disgusting values that are being celebrated. These are infantile values, you know, that celebrate um, mud, uh, uh, obesity, uh, satisfying sexual or physical or other appetites. Uh, we need honor. We need truth. We need uh, selflessness. We need restraint as it's being celebrated. And it's very easy. I can tell everyone in your audience, you turn off the TV set, read Plutarch's lives, read about Pericles, read about Cato the Elder, read about Cato the Younger. It's all there. Read Aristotle's ethics. Read Shakespeare's plays. Read about uh, Cordelia in King Lear. There are those models to be inspired, and they've been around for thousands of years. Hey guys, we had a fun packed day. We were here at Riverside Church. We got a chance to see this beautiful historical landmark. We went downstairs and snuck into the ensemble's rehearsal. And lastly, we went upstairs to the conference. Now, that conference was filled with a lot of terms and a lot of things that we might not have heard before. So what I recommend everyone do, go home and Google, look up some of the things that you saw and you didn't understand or you heard and didn't make sense to you. Remember, we're trying to have a new 
reality. We're trying to change our paradigm. We're trying to shift our paradigm. That was the name of the conference. And it was brought to you by the Executive Intelligence Review. So if you heard anything that didn't make sense or you need to look something up, I'm telling you, go on Google, look it up, do your own research. Don't believe what anybody tells you. You are your own genius. This has been Keziah Glow with another edition of Harlem 411. Stay tuned, and I'll see you next week.